Jai Hind viewers, welcome back to another panel discussion from MRO Digest Forums. Today we are looking at uh, what uh, should be an ideal strategy for modernizing defense assets, legacy defense assets. We have with us a very illustrious panel. Lieutenant Dr. Any Singh, he served as the Director General of Corps of Electronics and Mechanical Engineers. Director General Information Systems and was a founding member of the Armed Forces Tribunal Jabalpur. He specializes in armored fighting vehicles and played a key role in the design and development of bulletproof vehicle Takshak, Arjun Armored Recovery Vehicle. And he has made significant contribution in the development of Dhanush gun system. He has undergone a specialized training in Germany on of highway vehicles and has served in Moscow as military attache technical. We also have with us uh, Lieutenant General Dr. Anil Kapoor, who served as uh, Director General Electronics and Mechanical Engineers and Director General Information Systems. He's a chartered engineer. He was awarded the Eminent Engineer Award 2020 by Institution of Engineers. He is a professor of practice in IIT Tirupati and also a board member in their innovation hub. He writes and speaks on emerging technologies like C7, ISR and AI in many publications and platforms. And we also have with us Brigadier YVR Vijay who served in the core of electronics and mechanical engineers where he was chief managing director of an army base workshop. After retirement from the army, he entered the renewable energy sector where he was COO of Enercon India Limited and subsequently the COO of Suzlon Global Services Limited. And he's also steering uh, his own uh, group, a consultancy group called Strat MRO, the link to which is found in the, you can find it in the show notes below. General Anil Kapoor is also one of the directors there. So, sir, General Anil, the first question I will ask you. Sir, Indian military has a unique medley of vintage platforms of West and Eastern European origin. War in Ukraine has exposed many vulnerabilities of these. Do you think it would be prudent to modernize these or go in for replacements? Yeah, see, I feel that uh, uh, this question can be answered if we uh, look at the concept of, you know, a systems thinking or a systems approach, the concept of integrated readiness and, and, and through life capability management. Uh, what does this mean? It basically means, uh, you know, that uh, you have to create a by looking at creating a military capability that guarantees you military effectiveness which means that you are in a position in an advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis your enemy now to that is what is called the cutting edge or the operational advantage and things like that so to be able to retain that you have to first of all uh, take into account what is the adversary's capability? What is the gap in our military effectiveness? And uh, the, the uh, ability to retain the operational advantage, how we can do that? And what kind of equipment capabilities these vintage platforms which we have are able to provide? Now, one aspect which has really stood out in this Ukraine war is that uh, both sides, you know, both sides can't claim that uh, their systems, as they used to earlier do, you know, people used to say Ki, the M1 is supposed to be um, the most versatile tank in the world. The other side used to talk about their own platforms. Uh, now, all this, that has got demolished. And therefore, the... Um, most important lesson which comes out from there for us is that it is time for us to have 
our own bespoke weapon, bespoke uh, bespoke uh, weapon platforms, customized weapon platforms, because you try and bring in these technologies and field them in our context, you will find that uh, they will not work. Now, once we have taken that call, and you know that designing and, uh, and, and developing your own weapon platforms suited to your requirement takes time. So in the interim period, we have no option but to, uh, you know, to, to resort to technology insertion. So my answer will be that uh, it's basically all about the funds which you have. If one had all the funds available, yes, certainly one would have gone in for complete modernization. But because funds are an issue, therefore a pragmatic approach obviously is to go in for technology insertion. Now, historically, if you see most, even the, the most well-off countries are also doing this, because if you go back to World War II, you know, most weapon systems which were created during the war or post-war, like your Centurions, your Shermans, your M60s, T-54, 55, your Leopard 1, all this, we found that they have a light uh, and, and the starfighter, the famous starfighter, all these had a lifespan of about two decades. Within two decades, you found that all of them were withdrawn, not only from the, 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 the uh, military of the country where they were manufactured or developed, but also from all other. Even Pakistan got rid of the starfighters, remember, in early 70s. So, uh, uh, but later on, in uh, in in after uh, in the beginning, uh, in the early 80s or late 70s, whatever platforms have come out, the F-16s, your M1, your uh, Chieftain, followed by Challenger and Lek Lek and 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 you know uh, the Leopard 2 and all that, you find that all these countries are still maintaining these, retaining these, and operating these. Why? It is because, firstly, uh, today, you know, it has been found that weapon system effectiveness today is mostly all about software and electronics. You can bring in great capabilities into a weapon system by carrying out numerous electronic upgrades. You can enhance survivability. You can enhance uh, firepower and things like that. Secondly, is the cost. The cost of a of a M1 today is uh, is touching 200 crores. The cost of a F16 is touching around 500 crores. So countries are finding it very difficult to, you know, uh, to to carry out replacements. So I feel that for us, uh, the decision making is simple. First of all, we have to look at inserting technology, upgrading our vintage platforms. And why I'm saying that? Because that gives us time to develop our own, you know, subsystems, components, build up our defense ecosystem. And having spent about a decade in this exercise where we upgrade existing platforms, create such system houses who are, you know, preparing subsystems for the next generation combat systems and there after a, after a decade or so go in for uh, rolling out new platforms and therefore uh, i think we can divide the decision making into two one is technology insertion uh, where you carry out operational upgrades you carry out operational upgrades to improve operational capability you carry out technology upgrades to beat obsolescence both these are required and I've always maintained that the core of EME, while the user can look at operational upgrades, it is for the core of EME to look at technology upgrades because you have to sustain the system over a life cycle. So during your MRO activities, this is one area where we can look at, you know, inserting technology with the aim of defeating obsolescence. Yeah. So uh, there are numerous examples of how it can be done. And um, uh, the aspect of re replacement only comes if we find 
that with the existing platform, even after technology technological upgrades, we are not achieving military effectiveness over the adversary. That means we don't have the competitive advantage over the adversary. Then it is uh, time for replacements. So I feel uh, that is the approach which should be followed. Uh, at least for us, the, the aim should be that while we carry out technology uh, upgrades, at the same time, we end up creating a viable indigenous defense ecosystem also. There is no point inserting technology by buying it from abroad. Uh, thank you very much for that, sir. And, uh, you have uh, talked about legacy. You have talked about costs attached to equipment, uh, which are a very important uh, factor of decision making. So actually, uh, that brings me to uh, General Anil Kapoor. So Anil, what do you think is a good way forward to fix legacy equipment for contemporary and futuristic deployments? General Anil, please. Thank you. Thank you for that question, sir. I think uh, we have to start with what we call the character of war today. Uh, while the nature of war, they say, does not change, uh, but I think that from a VUCA environment, which we have always looked at in war, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, I think the new paradigm which is being talked of is quite relevant. It is funny, brittleness, anxiousness, non-linearity, and incomprehensibility. If you look at the Ukraine war which is going on, there is a lot of brittleness. Sometimes we feel Russia is on the high. Sometimes we feel, no, Ukraine is on the high. And therefore, you know, there's an illusion of strength on both the sides. And uh, when you look at uh, the kind of information warfare which goes on cyber, there's a lot of anxiety in both the sides and in the global environment as well. And of course, non-linearity we've seen uh, because of deep look, deep strike abilities that exist. And we've also had situations where Russia tried to get to Kyiv and had to fall back because of so many reminded of reasons. And the whole situation remains incomprehensible. So really speaking, if we have to look at a new paradigm, it has to be based on technology and data. We have to get data centric. I think the people advantage or the soldiering advantage or the force advantage will be to the side which can look at uh, realism in its uh, data analytics and imbibe technology into their game. Now, if we look at it in our own contexts, uh, you know, we've got a majority of our equipment, uh, critical equipment, which is, I won't call it obsolete, but which is legacy. And therefore, to fight a future war with legacy equipment is actually fighting blindfolded, to my mind. And therefore, when we look at the new environment and the character, which is driven by technology, I think, it is no longer a choice. It's a compulsion for us to build technology into our uh, system, legacy systems. And uh, I would therefore go by a concept, which uh, you know I've been uh, carrying with me for quite some time, is that there is a need for, a, for us as the armed forces to continuously enhance our technical thresholds at all levels. I think more importantly at the senior level, uh, to have acceptability, firstly, of the need for technology. Sometimes we feel, oh, we don't need, we, we're quite okay without it. I'm sorry. That thought will not do. That's a defeatist thought. That's a VUCA thought. We have to get into Pani. The second is, there's a continuous need to upgrade our infrastructure. There's no doubt. And equipment forms part of it. And everything that is infrastructure, including the TBA, needs to be re-looked at regularly. The third important thing is that we have to look at, when we look at war today, and Ukraine war is a very good example, which is rather long drawn. In our own case, we had a Parakram, which was a very long range deployment. And therefore, when we look at these long range deployments, can we look at preventive, predictive, uh, uh, sorry, preventive periodic maintenance as the paradigm for maintenance? The answer to my mind is no. I would feel that there is a need to look at uh, a predictive prescriptive maintenance. And therefore, what we need to look at when we look at legacy uh, with this is the following. First is, let's look at 
merging technology into everything that we do. And when we say merging technology into what we do, we have to look at condition monitoring systems. We have to look at sensors becoming part of our life. We have to look at IoT becoming part of our life. We have to look at data management, big data analytics, and these kind of platforms which need to become part of our life. And when we look at this kind of a paradigm, so first is getting your basics right. Now, let me get a bit into the equipment before I get in here. Now, let's look at any equipment today. Uh, the equipment must talk to you in war. You have to have well-defined logistic pauses, which are based in just-in-time needs, condition-based, and not periodic or preventive maintenance-based. Because that itself is a big change which we have to absorb in our thinking. So the thought has to change to creating predictive analytics, creating prescriptive analytics. And that will mean that we get into our uh, DNA technology. So if we were to look at a tank, which is T72, can we look at technology infusion? And, and we have to. I mean, it's not can. How do we look at it? I, I, because the why is not important today. It is a given the how is important. So I think that our training institutions, MCME, EME school, uh, our officers, uh, along with the academia that exists today, we've got a lot of technology innovation hubs. We've got a lot of startup ecosystem, which is actually looking at futuristic technologies. I think all these need to be put together to create what I call the three T's, task, team, and time. So we look at critical equipment. Create the ecosystem for it to bring it as contemporary and futuristic from an EME perspective. Unfortunately, what General Envy correctly brought out, uh, you know, it, uh, MRO has to be built into design. It is a home to tome activity. But obviously, uh, uh, now today, we have to look at technology infusion. And, and I don't think it is a difficult thing to do. A uh, lot of initiatives have been taken as it is, and a lot more need to be taken. Uh, all we need is a simple onboard computer, even if it is not there, one in some equipment, and a number of sensors to do data analytics. And that should be easily possible. The next important thing is funding for it. I would say that today, time has come when we look at our capital expenditures, let's allocate 60%, if not more, into managing legacy. That means upgrade of legacy. It should become a very formal activity. We've done a lot of upgrades in our own core. I mean, over a period of time, and we are all aware of the upgrades that have happened in armament and tanks. I think we need to go in for a very formalized upgrade program. And once we do that, there is funding, there is a team, there is a task, and there's a technology available. I think it will make all the difference. And then the other is, to make it futuristic, since all three of us have been in the information systems, the whole activity, not only operational MRO, has to have a huge database. And based on the database, we need to create decision support systems and very easy dashboards for all levels to understand when the intervention must happen. Now, to give you an example, in war, I mean, just because an engine, a tank engine has done uh, a stipulated hours, and the commanders start feeling jittery that it may not be able to do um, you know, service until the engine is changed. And that has been the thought most of the commanders sometimes carry. I think that mindset will change the moment we build technology. Because when you see your tank running in the green zone from the point of view of maintenance needs, you, are, you know that you can go on. And when you get amber, that is, again, guaranteeing some hours of operation before you do the change. So really, the equipment speaks to you. So I think to get legacy, a handle over legacy is very important. It's a compulsion. We need to think with head on our shoulder on it. High time we convert it into a program approach with formal funding, formal tasking, formal infrastructure in terms of uh, the PRL level 1, 2, 3, where some research has to go. Four to six, where prototypes have to be done, and seven to nine, where productionization has to be done. And our base workshops and our institutions in the army, I think, are best suited to lead this effort because some lead is required. I think we can lead it, 
and get supported from the ecosystem. Then I think we'll be moving ahead in a direction where we will be able to merge legacy with the future, which I think is a yawning need. Thank you. Well, thank you, General, for that uh, very detailed input on how technology, so uh, technology can address uh, legacy issues. And uh, actually, uh, you have said how we can push the envelope of technology and you know use that. So that actually brings me to Brigadier YVR Vijay. Uh, Brigadier YVR Vijay, how can unmanned systems complement uh, legacy defense warlike systems and enhance their lethality? Brigadier Vijay, please. Sir, Jain, sir. It's not a coincidence today that out of the four of us on this panel, all four have been involved in the information systems of the defense. Three of you have added it as a DGIS, while I have been uh, DDGIT. We are no longer just plain tank men or a radar man or a communication man. We have, um, we have got a force multiplier. We have enhanced ourselves with our knowledge of information systems and IT. When we look at uh, legacy systems, we have to look in the same manner. As uh, General Envy was bringing out, when you look at a legacy system, you have to look at the strategy. Uh, you have to look at what is our threat and what are our constraints. Now, uh, we are in a lucky situation looking at our enemy. Although our systems are 30, 40 years old, there is still 20, 30 years of life left in it because of the constraints that our um, enemy, especially on the Western Front, is facing. So we need to handle our legacy system so much better. We have to look at uh, a legacy system much like we look at our human body. You know, we don't discard ourselves uh, as we start performing less. We have empowered ourselves. We empower ourselves with knowledge. We empower ourselves with slowly refurbishing uh, and replacing and upgrading a lot of our parts, starting from maybe the knee to the hip joints to the heart we go in for bypasses we upgrade i keep upgrading our systems until we become absolutely useless or brain dead so similarly we have to look at our legacy systems in a manner that we can keep on getting some value out of it until we are ready to replace so the first of the things we should do is you know there's a huge amount of documentation existing on our legacy systems which we got to automate we have to enhance our inspections as general anil was bringing out the days of doing a simple preventive maintenance are over we have to go in for condition monitoring systems you have to go in for predictive maintenance you have to go in for the latest in preventive maintenances breakdown maintenances in fact just uh day four yesterday an EME officer contacted me uh, there's a company called gas tops and they have developed a method of uh, through ultrasound to continuously monitor the quality of lubrication and uh, grease in uh, equipment you don't need to stop an equipment and remove the grease and uh, send it to the for analysis so that's where it comes in so how do we go about it we got to make this legacy system a force multiplier by looking at what all can you add on to the system, not only directly onto the system, but using an environment of unmanned equipment, etc., to enhance the lethality of these equipment. So the first is, as we were working in C4I square, um, your automation is improved. Your situation awareness, as it keeps improving, as you're able to improve your recce and surveillance, automatically the lethality of your legacy systems improve you're not uh, functioning blind to the environment. Then there's a mistaken notion among many of us that we cannot incorporate IoT into legacy equipment. That is deeply flawed. You need not integrate IoT to the internet, etc. But there are so many sensors which you can integrate into legacy systems and you can use smaller networks to continuously keep monitoring it. You can use smaller networks within that equipment. You can use smaller networks within the subunit or in the formation. And you're continuously monitoring the state of your fleet. 
So you integrate IoT wherever possible, even if the network is available for a few minutes a day. Let us say your tank formation has moved ahead while it's on movement and moving through a, a difficult area, you're lost, you're not networked. But the moment you come to a halt, you can, with a localized network, quickly capture the health of the fleet. So IoT must get incorporated into the major critical subsystems of attack. You can use a lot of, you know, AR, VR, etc., to improve the quality of the people who are operating the system. To maintain a legacy system, if you have AR, VR, which is continuously guiding the person who is handling it, the quality of his repair goes up because he is gaining from the knowledge which is available outside. He is not using only his innate knowledge. Unmanned systems. We have now seen this time, especially we have been talking so much about the Ukraine war. A tank or a gun system by itself is a sitting duck. Because there are so many unmanned systems in the air which have come in to increase the lethality of the battlefield. So today, a combat group or a combat command uh, moving has to be supplemented with advanced recce and surveillance methods, better radars, better uh, you know integration with UAVs, with drones. So. When this comes in, you are reducing the vulnerability of your legacy system in the battlefield. Because using these unmanned systems, you are able to prevent that legacy system getting targeted until the legacy system is close enough to the battlefield where it is now becomes very effective. So we must use drones. You must use, uh, you know, uh, uh, drones not only uh, for surveillance, for recce and for... Uh, you know, targeting enemy, but you use drones for even your logistic supply. You use drones, uh, you use uh, maybe uh, UAVs, you can use uh, helicopters to speed up the logistic supply to a legacy system. A legacy system obviously has a lower, uh, a much, uh, you know, a higher MTTR and a lower MTBF compared to the latest systems. They need much more logistic support. So we have to look at how unmanned systems can assist us in logistic support for this legacy system while it's being used in the battlefield, using of drones, using of choppers to move spares ahead. And when a legacy system, let us say a T-72 tank or a T-90 tank, which is now 30, 40 years old, suddenly with all these systems is comparable and can compete with the latest in tanks. Same with guns. Once your capability of uh, looking ahead improves, your capability of directing your fire improves with these uh, drones and UAVs and surveillance and recce systems, this legacy system is more useful. But at the same time, the more important part for it, for us as uh, MRO, is to look at this legacy system must also be functioning close to the way it was designed initially. So one method, what General Anil Kapoor said, better preventive maintenance, condition-based monitoring systems, etc. But we have, it was there in the 80s, a lot of talk about how to store our legacy equipment better. We used to talk of better mothballing techniques, keep our equipment absolutely intact. That is somewhere died down over, over the last few years. Better storage conditions, better preservation techniques better coating, better painting, the silicon uh, moisture prevention methods. There's a lot of technology which has come in, which can ensure that our legacy systems do not degrade. So we will look at all this. And of course, all this generates data. And if you crunch data, you will always come up with a better MRO method of maintaining these. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Brigadier Vijay for giving us those insights into what is possible. Uh, stepping back a little bit now, uh, uh, the NB has been, you know, uh, he's got a huge body of work talking about strategic readiness, and he's got a very uh, grasp of the whole gamut of things which go into equipment readiness. So with that, uh, as a background, sir, can you give out, uh, NB, sir, can you give out a proposed methodology so that in future, we do not end up in such a situation 
where a large portion of the fleet is legacy? How can we assess as to when and how a complex system is to be modernized? Jana Indi, sir? Yeah, I, I feel, you know, first of all, to start with, there is a need to, uh, to, to change the attitude uh, to, or, or the mindset. Uh, the importance of giving a holistic look to operational capability has to be inculcated. See, we generally do not talk about these things. We don't, you know, it is just assumed that, okay, if a brigade is positioned here or a battalion is position, positioned here, well, uh, that's all what matters. You know, you just deploy it and ultimately uh, things will work fine. So first of all, I feel that equipment capability must be understood by all of that. Every equipment has got a specific ability to perform and, and give you a, the desired operational effect in a specified operational environment. For example, a system which may be, you know, doing some kind of a uh, operational task in the planes, when it is moved up into high altitudes, you cannot expect the same kind of a performance there. So I feel that equipment capability and measurement of equipment capability has to occupy center stage. Because till the time that is not done, the other actions, whatever we want or we wish, will never uh, uh, go through. So they must understand that war fighting, apart from, of course, your soldier soldier skill sets, it is all about equipment capability matching. Wherever you have a, what is technical technological advance, advantage? Technological advantage or technological overreach is all about you being able to perform better with your weapon systems vis-a-vis -vis the enemy. And if you do that, obviously, you will get that breakthrough. You have to match equipment capability. You have to find out what you can do, what the adversary can do, study those gaps, and then work on bridging these those gaps. Now, we know acquisitions take time. They, 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 they spread over at least seven to ten years for any major platform so in these seven to ten years while you are pursuing this acquisition the complete focus on the upkeep of the vintage or uh, legacy equipment is lost so uh, what happens that mro activities occupy a back seat and your equipment capability keeps declining so I think this aspect has to be understood by everybody that even if you keep an equipment mothballed in a garage, the effect of age, if not deployment and usage, will come in. If you deploy an equipment in deserts or in high altitude, the impact of deployment will come in. And if you use an equipment in a sandy terrain or in a marshy terrain or in an island territory, the impact of the environment will also come in. So this effect of age, usage, and deployment must be understood by them that as our body and our parts, body parts age, same thing will happen. And this was aptly reflected in this conflict because most of the systems which were taken out by the Russians were obviously either maintained or they had been taken out from, uh, from their usual uh, deep freezes where they tend to keep all the equipment, and yet they did not perform. So uh, I feel a new process has to be adopted, and that process has to put equipment capability in the center stage. I will recommend that the core of EME looks at drafting an army's industrial strategy, which gets transformed into a general staff policy statement, which lays out the method of measuring equipment capability and taking Correcting, uh, corrective act actions after a gap analysis. Because, and, and the best place I feel, the best time to do this analysis is during the annual Adam inspection or the technical inspection. And evolve a methodology by means of which, whether you want to do it through CBM, uh, through condition monitoring or data analytics or any other method, you must measure the sustainability KPPs the sustainability KPPs are, meantime, 
to repair, mean time between failures, mean, kilo, mean kilometer between failures, mean round between failures. We must have a system of monitoring this and, in fact, uh, putting it in, in, in uh, the history card of all the weapon systems. It should be there in red on top so that every commander, every CO knows what his equipment is capable of delivering. Then every uh, OC workshop knows how much effort he will need to set this right in case something happens to it. Now, once you have done this, then obviously you will be able to monitor equipment capability. You will be able to uh, take maintenance actions, whether periodic or predictive or prescriptive. You will be able to restore equipment capability. When you find the equipment capability drops below a particular band, you can fix that band. 80% of what was at this acquisition stage or 70% uh, of what it was at the acquisition stage, then you know it is time now to move it into the operation theater. That is your army base workshops to carry out uh, the overhaul. And at the base of overhaul level also, it should be very, very clear that the objective, objective which, which, which should be given by the DGME is that it has to be like new or zero kilometer condition. That means as if it is coming out from a factory, newly manufactured. So all kind of upgrades, whether it's a technology upgrade, operational upgrade, or even you know an aesthetic upgrade so as to make it look good. All these need to be done there so that when the weapon system comes out from the from our industrial, uh, you know, the, the army's own industrial base, it is fit for delivering another, uh, you know, mission like a new machine. But for that, it will be very important that this the industrial strategy should be clear as to what, how to uh, to retain equipment capability in our weapon systems throughout its life cycle. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for the giving that sort of a way forward. Uh, uh, coming back to uh, General Neil Kapoor, Neil, you, uh, you know, you have talked, you talked so much about technology and you've got now so much of research, I would say you have done in it, talked about it. So uh, the question which comes to mind, uh, Neil, is what is the technology landscape to manage the Legacy Anil, please. Now, uh, let me start by saying that uh, I've been speaking about humanizing assets. I think time has come for humanizing asset as becoming a necessity. It's no longer, like I said, it's a compulsion and no longer a choice. And therefore, when we talk of strategic readiness in the armed forces, it should be data centric. So at the strategic level, at the senior level, all of us must start analyzing the importance of being data centric in our strategic readiness rather than being driven by some policies which have become archaic if i may say uh, whether it is interventions major interventions or it is periodic preventive maintenance interventions which are tactical i think there's a need firstly to accept that everything must become data centric until we bring this as a part of our dna i think we will not achieve what I want to call as a strategic readiness index. We have to define a strategic readiness index, which is based on data. Then let's first fix the center of gravity of ours is legacy. So the first is, to my mind, that the strategic readiness index must look at legacy as the uh, major activity that must happen over the next five years. If that becomes part of our strategic thought, I think then technology becomes meaningful. And I always say when we humanize assets today, the whole interplay is between the nervous system, the circulatory system, and the endocrine system. So we have something called uh, sensors and software. So in each of the systems, we, if we were to emulate our human body, it's all about sensors and the nervous system, how the whole interplay is happening. There's a, there's a, there are sensors in our bodies which trigger so many things through nervous systems. So in a similar fashion, if we were to look at, um, you know, sensors being built into our legacy systems, 
And like I said, we'll need to, need to look at the whole PRL, technology readiness level one to nine, and make it happen. We'll have to look at nanotechnologies. We have to look at nano energizers and nano materials. I think that is where the future lies because when you start putting in anything in the legacy system, form fit function is very important. And anything that is bulky, I'm sorry, there may not be a place for it. So you'll have to perforce look at uh, getting so miniature into it that it is easy to get the FFF that we say form fit and function into it. So that is very important. The next is uh, there is a lot of automation in some of the equipment. Uh, but there may be none. So first we'll have to bring up an automation system into our equipment where it doesn't exist, like uh, why we are brought out that, you know, bring in drones uh, and connect them through a autopilot and uh, onto an onboard computer and then build autonomy into it through sensors. So I think automation to autonomy or automation through to autonomy will be a very good thing for which we'll need onboard computers. We'll need sensors integrated with the uh, uh, zonal um, uh, ECUs, electronic control units. So a number of sensors be, being controlled by electronic control units with a central onboard computer where all this happens. So that will be one very good tech. And if I may say, time has come for EME and Army to look at these kind of startups. I mean, all our courses now in Military College of EME, DME School, and I, let's align themselves. Let a course not do a project. Let it do a startup. So create startup and courses. Let them work on these kind of problems to look at legacy as to what we need to build into them. How do we build bytes into them, built-in test equipment, which talks? How do we build data analytics structures into them? How we create visual displays, dashboards? So all this is very important. And then when we look at our own skill development, I think that is also to undergo a paradigm change. Uh, we have to get data-centric. We have to look at augmented and virtual realities being built in. And we have to now use data for three things, which I say first is the business intelligence, which gives you a, a cause effect kind of analysis. Augmented intelligence, which helps you in decision making. That means uh, if I were to take an example, if something is in the amber zone and it is operationally very critical at this point in time, it's a decision to be taken that should we go on or should we change or should we do an intervention? So those are the kind of augmented intelligence inputs that come to you by way of data analytics. And of course, artificial intelligence, which takes you into the future. Then we need to build in robotics and drones in a very big way. And 3D printing should become part of our DNA. In fact, all our mobile uh, workshop lorries that we used to talk of need to be futuristic, smart manufacturing compliant with 3D printing in the battle space. And when we did, so much of data and we are talking of data and clouds i think communication and cyber we cannot uh, lose sight of and as a mro i think it is a given today that communication and cyber must be built into our systems we cannot do without it and and therefore now if i were to look at all the pillars which we talk of sustainment when it is hr we need to have past learners who are futuristic in their thought who are futuristic in being able to analyze data. Even a craftsman of Emi, soldier craftsman, must become a data scientist. He has to be data dependent. And, and that is a fact sheet he should look at every time. We have to have uh, illustrated like electronic technical manuals so that we all get very compliant. Like we have a mobile phone, which is actually a moving computer, a moving encyclopedia in our pockets. I think that kind of system we need to generate as our ETMs, our infrastructures have to become sensor compliant a lot of, with a lot of automation and autonomy built in. I think we need to think through that. And, and that's the new paradigm. Uh, our space management has to undergo a little change with 3D printing and all these things happening. And I think uh, if we were to now uh, put all these technologies together, I think it's a, it's a totally new landscape that we need to think about. But it all starts with the thought of humanizing asset and making ourselves, if I may use the word vulnerable, that our strategic readiness index today is low because our legacy equipment is not compliant to the future battle space. If, if we harbor that thought as a vulnerability, I think funds, teams, tasks, and the endeavor to do it 
in a yesterday mode would fall so uh, so i think that is where uh, i would like to put this legacy into the future in a strategic readiness index paradigm thank you sir thank you very much anil for completely giving it a uh, well rounded look uh, i'm sure there's so much uh, so many insights in what you said will be useful to our viewers so you talked about uh, 3d scanner 3d printer so that brings me to a question uh, to brigadier yvr vijay uh, how can 3d scanners and uh, 3d printers be used to enhance the life of legacy defense equipment brigadier vijay please yes thank you now if we uh, use the latest in technology in uh, it in all our new technology is coming in let us see how uh, we can you know uh, have the best of uh, preventive maintenance techniques condition based monitoring techniques uh, predictive maintenance use it there we make our maintenance tasks so much more efficient we improve our inspection techniques we use the latest in uh, technology ultrasound scanning uh, gear, um, grease analysis etc and come out with the best of techniques but finally to maintain a legacy equipment it is the supply chain it is the spares that are critical if i want to retain the functionality of a system every spare of it should be as close to it as it was when it was at 0 kilometers or at uh, zero say uh, number of rounds fired so it is the spares which matter now as an equipment ages as the oems suddenly find that they are not able to sell this equipment because there are more modern equipment coming in the spares is what gets affected 90% of our problems in managing legacy equipment emanates from that one field spares if i have the spares at the correct time at the correct place and replace it at the correct time you can maintain this legacy equipment as close to the way it was designed till such time it is operationally not capable of take, uh, i mean technically the uh, adversary has got far superior equipment but i can keep maintaining this equipment and 3d scanners 3d printers play a huge role on it they play a huge role in enabling our obsolescence management management of obsolete parts management of drying up the, the supply chain they can address all these problems today we have 3d scanners and 3d printer combinations which can almost replicate every part you have metallic 3d printers you have 3d printers which can use alloys you can have composites in fact you can improve the performance of many of the parts of a legacy equipment by using the latest advanced materials like composites and alloys etc so 3d printer 3, 3d scanner combination is a great for uh, i mean uh, enabler to maintain this legacy equipment as close to the way it was designed to the process of reverse engineering so reverse engineering with this must be pushed through the mro channel to enhance your spares availability you can do on demand spares manufacture you can customize all the legacy parts you can have the drawings and develop a, a much more supreme tot to what you originally had you can start printing all your obsolete spares you can reduce your cm lead times there's a huge amount of cost saving which can happen in tooling in generating inventory your prototypes your testing becomes faster so if we empower all our not maybe not at field workshop level but at intermediate workshops the base workshops and higher levels with a powerful environment where you have the latest in 3d scanners the latest in 3d printers manufacturing various types of uh, using various types of material ranging from pure metal to composites to alloys you will suddenly find that you have improved the spares availability by a huge margin 
initially in small amounts we feel cost is a factor but when the spare supply has dried up cost you still got to maintain a costlier equipment so uh, we have to uh, look at all our base workshop intermediate repair workshops to see what is the ideal type of 3d scanners and 3d printers that each of them need so that they can go ahead thank you very much uh, brigadier vijay you have uh, given uh, very practical ways of uh, how we can resolve crises by using these new techniques uh, General LB, sir, with that, we are actually at the end of the panel discussion today. May I request you to sort of give your concluding remarks, General LB, sir? Today, we uh, uh, carried out a discussion on uh, how to make these legacy systems, you know, current or uh, combat effective. And uh, the whole uh, a lot of forward looking suggestions have come from uh, all those who have participated. Uh, uh, so we have we have finally you know one thing is very clear that uh, for any military to retain its co combat edge or military effectiveness it is very important that the bulk of its inventory must be must be current or at least have capabilities at par with what the adversary has got now we know the kind of adversary we are facing on one side an adversary which is aspiring uh, for tech te not only technological parity but technological dominance over uh, the only superpower in the world so uh, that is a situation in which we are operating and therefore it is very important that uh, from the weapon system effectiveness point of view uh, we do modernize our legacy uh, systems if we had enough money it was not a problem. We were also in a position to, you know, put in 400, 500 billion dollars a year in the defense budget. All this would have been possible. But now with the defense budget, which is, of course, roughly one third of that of our northern neighbor, uh, we have to spend that whole thing wisely and nothing better than taking a full systems view of this. Now, what is this systems view? I I always uh, have maintained that uh, the soldier and the system are, are the two most important battlefield operating systems. Apart from that, of course, several more. Now, the soldier has to be, first of all, tech savvy, aware and skilled. I mean, second comes the platform itself. The platform must have capabilities to not only move in the battlefield, but to survive, take hits and continue fighting. Now for that, all these legacy systems based on whatever, uh, you know, we have seen in, in the war in Ukraine, in Israel and, and the previous Gulf Wars and all that, it is time to look at technology insertion. There is a need for a integrated view of the whole the manner in which, uh, you know, I can only mention what uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam has written in his book uh, about uh, his mentor, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. He said that when the uh, space program was started, he was very clear and he came there and he not only started uh, the, the, the you know, the, the design development of the rocket system, but also all the subsystems. And therefore, a large number of programs were started on rocket fuels, propulsion systems, aeronautics and space material, tracking system instruments. All this was started off. And the net result was that today, uh, all these efforts of the past uh, three or four decades have catapulted uh, ISRO to, to the big league. And uh, uh, this is only because of the visionary thinking of the people who were uh, in charge. Now, now, when we do this technology insertion programs, it should not be specific to only that particular platform. It must have some residual capability so that when I de develop a fire control system or integrated uh, IFCS for the T-72, I should be very clear that I am actually develop, developing it for the FRCV. 
if I make an auxiliary power unit for the BMP, I should be very clear that this is actually meant for uh, uh, for the FICV. If I do a water propulsion system for a wheeled APC, I should know very well that look, this will go into the future eight by eight, you know, strike a kind of a vehicle which ultimately we will design. So that is how the approach has to be a holistic systems approach so that what we do today not only impacts the current set of legacy equipment but also gives me the ability to fall back to all these suppliers and tell them that for the next generation combat systems i will be needing these systems from you so you should be ready to provide that i feel that in the defense sector uh, a long-term holistic view has to be taken on the lines of what we have a best practice already available in our country you know done by isro all we have to do is replicate the same here into not only the modernization of, uh, of of legacy systems but take it forward with the aim plus of using you know these systems or systems similar systems with enhanced capability into future camp combat system that's how i feel this dream of self reliance and defense and the uh, provision of greater combat effectiveness weapon system effect effectiveness to our army both these can be realized concomitantly that's all thank you thank you very much general mr sir for that uh, those concluding remarks with that, uh, on behalf of the viewers and the subscribers, I thank the panelists for uh, so much of wisdom and such insights in today's panel discussion. And uh, we bring this particular panel discussion uh, to a close. We look forward to bringing more such panel discussions uh, for our viewers and subscribers. Jai Hind.